you guys, Marty Schwartz here. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee at one of the most amazing places I've ever been, Songbirds Guitar Museum, and I'm with the curator, David Davidson. How are you, my friend? Good to see you, Marty. Nice I to was, have you back. I was so excited to come back, and uh, this place, I, I can't put it into words. You really have to come here to really believe it, but it's basically uh, the most amazing guitar collection in the world, I would say. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I, I know that we put a lot of time and effort into getting this place right so people can come and enjoy it and get a full guitar experience. Yes, for sure. So now what we're gonna do is something very exciting, a little James Bond vibe to it. Mm -hmm. we're, going into, <laughs> we're going into the vault, right? Yes, we are. So you're gonna show me some things and we're gonna pick a, a few guitars out to like kind of go into a deep dive, right? Absolutely. All right, I'm excited. Let's All do right, it. Let's do it. So this is the so vault. So come on in. This is the vault and this houses just under a hundred guitars. And in here, you see some of the rarest electric guitars ever made. Prototypes from the Fender Company, prototypes from the Gibson Company, as well as some of the best playing instruments with great histories. But I figured we could pick a couple of guitars out. Man, I don't even know where to start. You're the expert here, so. This guitar here was owned by a girl, a guy named Earl Findlay. Earl, played with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. This is a 54 Stratocaster. And Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys were like the Rolling Stones of their time in the country western circuit. Okay. This um, Telecaster is a 1956, and it was owned by a gentleman named Gilly. As you can see, proudly displayed. Most people would put a mark on their guitar at that time. And usually when you see a good pattern of wear on a guitar, it's usually for a reason, you know? It usually means that they played the guitar. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just wasn't a wallflower. And this is Don Rich's Telecaster, played on Hee Haw for many, many years. This is a crushed glass finish. The guitar was originally a silver color, but the clear lacquer turns yellow with age because it's made with celluloid base so that's why the guitar appears gold now. Well, this guitar belonged to Brian Setzer, but we do have pictures of the original owner playing the guitar when it was brand new in 1957. Wow. So why don't you check that out and get a chance to give that a workout. Wow. That is a really good sounding instrument. Nice. Man, these are so awesome. Uh, I can't wait to play them. Can you plug me in? Absolutely, let's do it. Thanks for letting me out, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's we not, can keep you there all day. Yeah, I could be there all day. <laughs> we got this beautiful strap, but real quick, I wanna thank Peak Music Stands for helping make this episode possible. They make the lightest and best guitar stands. And you know, we've got these very fancy guitars here. So we've got them in the peak stands. And we're gonna leave a link below so you can check out more about them and just wanna thank them again uh, for helping this premium content continue to be made. So just to recap, first of all, it plays amazing. You know, it's an unbelievable thing. I, I just really don't think they made bad feeling guitars back then. Um, this one happens to play and sound well. Sometimes you get one or the other. It's really great when it all comes together. Now it's a 64, I think I no, remember. No, 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 this is a 57. 57? Yeah. You were saying this was owned by Brian Setzer at one point, who is a fantastic uh, musician, so uh, he probably kept it dialed in pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, it's always great to buy a guitar that was owned by a pro because you usually know that they're not gonna buy a guitar that isn't gonna sound good or isn't gonna play well. Right. And a lot of times, Pros take guitars like this and they dial them in for themselves and sometimes that means making modifications. But this guitar is very original and very correct. And you were also talking about the uh, color, you didn't, it didn't have a name. Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, almost all of these colors were original Duco, DuPont automotive paints. And usually if you go back in the old paint chip books, you can find the name of the paint. But in this case, we couldn't really dial in exactly which aqua it was. There were many different choices, so we just call it aqua and play it safe. And so 57, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with the pickups back then? Well, they were all you know just regular single coil. Um, Get, and the switch that is a three-way switch, not like a modern Stratocaster with a five-way switch. Right, right. But, you know, when we were kids, we used to take a match and stick it in there yeah, and hold yeah. the spot in between so you can get that sweet spot, so you get that yeah. out-of-phase sound, that very Clapton-esque sound that there you can go. get. I think I was able um, to get it. I've practiced getting yeah, it. Yeah, you so. just got to move that switch. Here's the front. 
the secret spot. Oh, oh, there we go. And then you can go back, right? Yep. Oh, I think I got it. Glassy and bell-like. Yep, no doubt. But, you know, <laughs> one of the things that amazes me about these guitars is the fact that when they started making the Stratocaster in 1954, who would think that you could still go into a store today and buy essentially the identical guitar? Usually technology evolves and they yeah. make things and they change things and they improve things. Well, they got it right the first day. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a tribute to, to uh, the Fender Company and what they were doing. Nice. Well, let, let me hear the, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, pickup, the different pickup configurations. Sure. Let's see what we got. I was, the intro, I was playing the, the classic, you know, mm -hmm. up front. <laughs> Got the classic middle, which I actually am a big fan of the middle. Yeah, it's a very woody tone on yeah. this particular guitar. Okay. Back. How thick are the is the glass here? Well, I think all the glass, all the glass is coming out of that guitar <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now. I'm, I mean, I can't. Kind of hard to beat that. Just another amazing guitar with another unique color that I don't think I've really seen. Yeah, this is uh, Desert Sand, which is actually the factory undercoat or primer okay. that they would use underneath the pastel colors. Oh, just back the in pastel the 50s. ones? Yeah, this is a first year Stratocaster, so, so what 1954. Year? And uh, this was owned and built by a Fender employee named Earl Findlay. Earl went on to play with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys for a while, which were like the Rolling Stones of their time in Western country music. Okay. Uh, they played all over Southern California and Texas. Leo Fender was enamored with them and would literally give guitars to them to play and then film them and then ask for their input when they came back to the factory. Wow. Like, so what do you think of this? What do I need to change? But this is a very, very amazing guitar. You're talking about them filming so far back. I mean, that's so innovative to yeah. be doing that. Yeah, I mean, he would literally show up to the country fair with his eight millimeter, you know, yeah. camera with no sound, and he would just, you know, kind of get a look and see how people held them, see if they were balanced correctly. What was he doing? before making guitars? Uh, he was a, like a TV, had a TV and radio repair shop. Oh. Or a radio repair shop, really. Okay. And uh, he worked with another guy named Doc Kaufman and they were had a partnership and eventually went their own ways. And Leo uh, started by making uh, lap steel guitars. Okay. Okay, and then found the need to uh, invent the Spanish style guitar with the rounded neck that you could sit and play like you were playing in a formal position. He started off with making what was the Fender Esquire, which eventually became the broadcaster, telecaster that you know so well. Yes, and, and we have two episodes uh, on my channel featuring a bunch of other guitars from Songbirds with a lot of knowledge added to that too. So yeah, you have some of the prototypes there in those yeah. videos. Yeah, we talked to uh, the, the, was the no caster or the yeah. broadcaster? Yeah, we had the broadcaster and the Esquire yeah. with, uh, with the uh, lamp button switch, pretty cool. So you guys can check that out yeah, as well. absolutely. <laughs> oh, and this is called the ashtray? Uh, yeah, that's the ashtray. If that's bothering you, it's easy to pull off. No, right? not at all. It was okay, just, but just that was a... the ashtray. It was the bridge cover. I mean, I'm sure they didn't want to call it an ashtray, but everybody wanted to put it on top of their amp and leaving their cigarette in it when they played. <laughs> Yeah. Because it was metal and you didn't have to worry about it burning the yeah, top of Yeah, and I don't see ramp. any uh, cigarette marks up here. Not right? on this a... one. No, maybe he was a non-smoker in a, in a rare, rare day <laughs> where everybody smoked, you know.
Oh, and this was used more of a... So... <laughs> They probably did use that bridge pickup a lot back. back Absolutely. Then. And this guitar, if if we if we were to plug it in and see the hours logged on the pickup selectors, I would guess it was like ninety two percent bridge pickup. Maybe. I mean, you think about the voicing of this guitar, even compared to the guitar you just played, and totally. then think about the voicing of this guitar um, probably being much more dialed in with the original Esquire and yeah. the broadcaster because all those players came up playing those guitars first. This was a very new guitar when this, this came out. It does really uh, sound different than the other one. First telly that we that we've got going here. This is the first telly of the of day. The day. Telly yes, of the, the day. Telly of the day, and this is an incredible one. Yeah, this is uh, just so cool. You were saying in the in the vault, but something about the term glass. This guitar was made. It was one of three that were made uh, by Fender. One was made for Buck Owens. One was made for Don Rich, and one was made for George Fullerton from Fender, and he was uh, you know senior vice president. And this guitar is made out of a crushed glass that's applied to the wood, and then it's covered with a clear lacquer that's nitrocellulose or cellulose. So that turns yellow with age. So this guitar, believe it or not, started off like a silver color and Ooh. is now faded to gold played by Don Rich uh, in the Hee Haw TV show for years and years. A lot of people grew up with this. Uh, I was lucky enough to take this guitar over to Vince Gill's house a couple of years ago, and when he saw it, he welled up. It was uh, very meaningful because Don Rich was his personal hero. Wow, can you just break down the history of Songbirds? I mean, we're, we're, it's pretty new. Right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's less than three years old. And, and how it came to be? I have a store in New York, and uh, one of my clients had come to me and uh, had started to uh, have interest in uh, Telecasters at first. And he was gonna put together a small collection of Telecasters. And the small collection of Telecasters became, oh, I like the Stratocaster too, and became a Stratocaster and Telecaster collection. And then we discovered Les Pauls and then 335s, and we can go on and on and on. Rickenbacker, Gretsch, Martin, uh, banjos, basically everything. And, and it grew over, um, about the last 24 years. Okay. So all the guitars belong to the one source. And uh, so I'm happy to say that I own them all, at least for a minute, <laughs> until they were paid for. But the great thing is, is that uh, that I was able to find these guitars and that we continue to find them. And, and, and the people at my shop work really hard every day combing basically, and we've traveled very far to get them. It's an incredible thing to be able to put something like this together. As far as the structure and everything else, it's such a historic location being in the original Chattanooga Choo Choo. I mean, not for nothing, but when Elvis was coming across the country from, uh, from Memphis and going to Atlanta, he stopped in this very train station wow. and drank at the bar up front. And it's a pretty <laughs> cool story of a really historic building. And what we're sitting in right now is the original luggage room Wow. Okay, for the choo-choo. So this is a luggage storage area. Wow. Okay, and it went through a couple of other things over the past several dozen years. 
but we had this idea to make this into a museum after a while, only because we felt like we had all of these guitars and we wanted to be able to give it back and let people sh share in them. So it's not unusual for someone to come here and we take them in the vault and hand them a guitar that they would never ever have a chance or an experience to, to touch. Thank you again. This guitar was another just one of a kind, priceless uh, piece of art. I'm glad you got a chance to play it. Me too. It needs to be played. Yeah, me too. Thank you. So now we have the famously unfamous Gilly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the early days of television, uh, a lot of unknown artists would get their chances on like the Ted Mack Amateur Hour or things like that. And they would get their chance to be up there. And a lot of guys had their names inlaid in the fingerboard or they'd have a leather wrap with their name. This guy just chose to put like some mailbox letters. Yeah. You know, kind of stuck up oh, there. Oh, yeah. Is that what these Gilly. are? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. A lot of people would do stuff like that to kind of get their name out there. And we don't really know who Gilly was. We have some pictures of him. So he was probably real close to being famous, <laughs> at least in his own mind. He did have two of these guitars made in this custom walnut finish. Uh, this one, and we have the other one, which is in much, much cleaner condition. This one here has a little wear and tear, and this was probably his favorite of the two. Yeah. Uh, this one has the nice hard V neck, which I really love the sound, the, or I should say the feel of. And both of these give you that the pickup on this are very classic, quacky, country-sounding pickups. And I think that that's, this era uh, from 1955 to 1959 Telecasters really signify the sound of the country music sound that people are looking for. Yeah, let me go back to that bridge. Let's see. Uh... Very quacky. Quacky, yeah. yeah. That's that, that is. I'm not used to the. Uh, oh, you take that off. Just pops right off. It. There you go. Hand it to me. I'll put it on the floor for you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> begging to be on that bridge pickup. It is. As time evolved, they changed the pickup design from the early 50s flat pole to the staggered pole piece design, uh, looking to bring those brighter tones out of the pickup. Uh, the earlier guitars are definitely much more subdued. So like I said, I think this era from 55 to 59 generated probably the best country music guitars ever made. Keith Richards, why, mm -hmm. why do you think Keith Richards leaned into a telly so much. Yeah, he leaned into an early Telecaster and the first thing that he did was he took that neck pickup out and he put a Gibson PAF in there. Uh. And I think that, that what he was trying to do is kind of get his own, total own sound with Macabre, which is his nickname yeah, for the yeah. guitar. You know, take that low E string off, give it a special tuning, dial in both of those pickups to give him that particular sound. And it yeah. became his sound. Right. And, and that's what's great about these particular guitars is you can dial them in and get your own sound. Once again, having the time of my life at a Guitar Mecca here, <laughs> Songbirds Guitar Museum, with uh, the great and knowledgeable, both great and knowledgeable, David Davidson. Thanks again, David. Thank you, Marty. Really appreciate it. Always we're a blast. Always glad that you're here. We want you to keep coming yeah, back. Oh, you guys have been so welcoming. We're, we're going to come back as much as you'll take us. Anyway, you guys got to check out Songbird's Guitar Museum. And also, once again, a quick thanks to Peak Music Stands for holding all these amazing guitars and keeping them safe. Uh, hope to see you guys again real soon. Take care.